校内で瀬川さんをアイドル扱いするのは禁止されてるんだぞ Then and now せめてこの走り方でサルを泳ぶ必殺マシン Yeah, I remember to stay in school, kids. Cold opener featured something that could only really be shown in a toy produced property without a lawsuit. Oh god, is this a show where they all have battleizers? I don't think even the Toshi Tendo would want a world like that. Of course, Doremi had to be a fan of her company's major IP that seemed to be going through a bit of an identity crisis. Kicks are the writer's gimmick, don't steal that, or we might get another Tyson film. Though one thing both franchises had in common back in the day was an over usage of kid guest stars. Guess they weren't able to book Al Yuki in time. And like many kids, Doremi's classmates enjoy play pretending a sentai like this kid. Yeah, yeah, Mondo, save it for the children's card game. Anyway, having seen her in the latest episode of his show, Amno became a slight fan of Onpu, if at least by association. This ended up clashing with a sixth grader named Hashimoto who tried to get some autographs off of her. This resulted in Onpu getting in a little trouble with the vice principal. And as big a stick in the mud as this guy is, he did have a good point about how she shouldn't be essentially bringing outside business ventures with her to school. I'm pretty sure they're already pushing their luck with the child labor unions. Still, Amino tried to defend her. <laughs> Acting like a pompous freedom fighter, Hanya ultimately bending over to the first authority figure. Yep, you are the truest of white knights, kid. He did end up doing the right thing by bringing Seki into the conversation, as she likely would have been able to resolve the situation. I say would have, because yet again, Onpu used brainwashing to solve all of her problems. She of course tried to justify it later by pulling out Majuruka's anti-curse charm that in a clever little bit of visual storytelling looked like a skull thanks to some shading. Then we later learned from Della that she was using up a lot of spheres which yeah you can guess where all of those were going to. I think for even anyone watching this for the first time can easily tell where all of this is leading. But I will say though, I like how in every situation in which Ompu uses this spell, it ultimately proves to be rather needless. As I said, Seki probably would have been able to bail out Onpu no problem, Shuzo didn't even realize she had turned into a witch, and she likely would have won the town show without any help. And yet she always chose to use brainwashing because of her own sense of almost sociopathic entitlement, the very concept of autonomy be damned. She's not necessarily a terrible kid, just one clearly divorced from the idea of ethics and consequences. And I gotta say, I like how they're building up this plotline, especially based on a later scene in the same episode. Meanwhile, to show her gratitude for his attempted white knighting, Ompu invited Amino to go with her to the toy studios. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see the But he was able to meet his true idol. Battle Ranger! Interestingly enough, Bell Red here was left uncredited for whatever reason, even though the villain he fought got a credit. I almost want to say he sounds like Ryuchiro Nishioka, who played the Red Sentai of the season that aired the same year as this episode, Gogo 5. <laughs> If it was him, then I'm not sure why they wouldn't want to flaunt that credit for the sake of cross-franchise synergy, maybe there were some contractual issues. Also, fun fact, the cast of Gogo 5 actually recorded some at-home messages encourage everyone to take care of themselves during this pandemic, just because they played the emergency response Sentai, which, needless to say, is pretty awesome. They later dropped him off back at home, and oh no, this bride is going to have speaking lines, isn't she? So yeah, Kaori saw the two parting ways, and of course assumed they had been on a date, though she wasn't the only one. <laughs> yeah, that's about what I expect out of an encounter between Gopamon and Palmon. But yeah, Hashimo had seen them together, and thus wants someone from his class to give him a letter challenging him to uh... <laughs> Understandably, Amno was a little hesitant about fighting an older kid, but changed his mind when he had heard that he was a bully, and his really overblown self-righteousness took over. Better be careful, Aiko, or else he might drag you to another knockoff Dragon Quest world. In between all of this, we got another instance of Umbu using and abusing her magic. 
。今日のおかずはな。チンジャオロースよ。私がピーマン嫌いなの知ってるくせに。Hey, just be glad you're at least getting pork. There's no beef in here, so you wouldn't really call it bell peppers and beef, now would you? And of course, she used her magic to fix this completely pointless problem. Yeah, enjoy your dinner at Denny's along with an extra curse there, kid. Anyway, Amno and Hashimoto had their fated clash at sunset. Though, since this clearly wasn't Die Ranger, there was no epic one on one fight, so they made a traditional three on three. Kid, go back and watch Jetman, or at the very least, Mega Ranger, as clearly you watch way too many of the more milk t o a s e a s o n s Yeah, even as a lover of the OG Power Rangers, I have to admit, Ju Ranger wasn't all that great. Of course, like any kids trying to be Rangers, their fight amounted to pretty much just a slap fest. Still, the Ojama Majo decided to intervene by asking the magical stage to stop the fight. <laughs> Did I mention yet that the way of this episode would player go on to show run the actual magical Sentai? Yeah, more about that during the closing thoughts. Anyway, Kai, or Hoka in this case, saved Amino, but Hashimoto also happened to believe in true gender equality, and thus didn't mind turning this into a prototype for Precure. However, Amino finally started to realize some of the deeper teachings of Ishinomori Sensei and tried to call off the fight. And legit, this kind of did feel like something out of a good tokusatsu with both sides realizing the futility of their fight as they weren't even sure what they were fighting over in the first place. So, of course, it all turned out to be a big misunderstanding, which, yes, is a tired cliche, but at least this one had a touching twist as the reason Hashimoto won Ompu's autographs was for his little sister and her classmates. Learning this, Amno promised he'd photocopy a bunch of pictures of Ompu so that he could give it to his sister and her classmates. This won Hashimoto over, and as a new friend, he said he'd get Amino a Chogoking of the Battle Rangers, which, yeah, you might want to get a display case for that stuff. With the day saved, the Ojama Sho Sentai made their exit just as Seki arrived after learning there was a fight. Though, I guess they need to work on their teleportation tech, as the episode ended with our heroines having taken a little fall. This was a cute and really fun episode, especially if you're into Super Sentai like me. For the fans of the spandex, we got a ton of fun references to mostly the Showa era of the franchise, which, while certainly a little goofy at times, was also a very imaginative period, which worked well in combination with the Ojama show. For their roles, the witches showed their more sensible sides for the most part, especially in regards to Ompu and her building subplot. It was a nice, subtle plot episode for the series, and a pleasant love letter to their Tokusatsu brethren. As I've mentioned in the past, one of the writers on this show, including this episode, was Atsushi Maikawa, best known in these parts as the head writer of Fresh p r e c u r e but also for his work on Super Sentai. Just going by this episode, you could tell he was clearly a fan of that franchise and Magical Girls, so he pretty much combined the two several years later when he became the showrunner for both the aforementioned Fresh and Maho Sentai Maji Ranger. And yeah, while they could be a little hand fisted with their references, especially when Amino went full Akiba Red, the lesson of this episode also did strike at the core of Shotaro Ishinomori's writing in that his characters will always seek the resolution with the least amount of conflict. In this case, it came about as a result of two fandoms recognizing that while they did have some overlapping interests, that didn't mean they had to argue over it, something you could never teach these days. Meanwhile, on the less geeky side of things, the Ompu subplot got more subtle development and clear build to the character's downfall all due to her own hubris. Both of these stories were fairly self contained, and yet they really managed to blend them well together. So, overall, this was a really good episode that clearly built towards the big climax of the season, and was also a nice peek into how Maikawa would eventually create his two most well regarded works. Seriously, I can't be the only one who would want to see a team up between Maji Red and Peach, right? Sorry for not posting Wednesday videos for a couple of weeks, I just really want to get these done. Still, with the usual Sunday slot now wide open due to there being no Tropical Roost this week, I think we could squeeze a couple more bonus reviews in this week. We'll see. So look forward to it. Until then, though, fair for now, my friends, and um, hold on. Hello? Oh, my food's here? Okay, I'll be right down. What can I say? I like the old flip phones.